Allow me to toot the Antipodean horn for just a moment. I'm about to make a controversial statement. You see, I think that New Zealand and Australia have the best coffee in the world. Now wait, wait, wait. I know, I can't prove that. I haven't been to every country in the world, but I have been to Italy. The benchmark, the one who sets the rules for what espresso should be. And I haven't had a good coffee yet. So what does that say? You see, even at home, this coffee here made in a mocha pot, cafetiere, whatever you want to call it, is a uh, wholly fine in terms of caffeine content, but in terms of flavor, it's severely lacking. Completely inadequate, you see. It's just too hot. The water comes through, it scorches everything around it, breaks down all of those uh, delicious flavors that have been roasted into those beans. And what are we left with? The pressure too high and the steam too hot. An Australian barista conducted a uh, series of tests with a bunch of international scientists and it ended up being published in Matter in about January 2020. Now, what they concluded was that Italian espresso machines typically have too fine a ground, they're using too much coffee and too high a pressure. And as a result, huge amount of coffee wastage, but also you can clog the machines and it's pretty variable as to what that coffee is going to taste like when it comes out due to the imprecision of the extraction. So what they found was by increasing the coarseness of the grind, by reducing the amount of coffee and also uh, reducing the pressure that they could get a more reproducible coffee shot with significantly less coffee waste. And apparently the flavor was absolutely sublime. So all this has got me thinking about coffee at home. If bitterness increases with temperature and pressure, then surely the inverse should be true, right? Well, yes and no. It's not quite as simple as that. So what I want to do is make myself a cup of coffee in the most ridiculously complex method I can think of. It might take a few hours, but what we're going to do is we're going to make a few different cups of coffee at relatively precise temperatures at relatively consistent temperature intervals. So to see how they come out. But to do that, we need my favorite. We need the best man alive. Kenny's back. So if you're new to the channel, you may not have met Kenny yet. Uh, he's a magnetic hot plate stirrer and he does all the hard work for me basically. So he'll use this little pill to stir it up. And he's got a little heating element underneath make sure that we get a nice, relatively precise temperature. So running on the assumption that some of the compounds in coffee will hit uh, some sort of solution equilibrium, I've increased the amount of water I was anticipating to 300 milliliters as opposed to 200. No coffee left behind. So we're doing the room temperature one first. It's about 21 degrees Celsius in here. See you in 300 minutes. I chose 300 minutes based on a study I read that indicated that that period of time was around where maximum concentration of caffeine was hit. So, on the switch to 60 degrees Celsius or 61 degrees Celsius, I've noticed that there seems to be a as soon as you put as soon as you put the coffee in there's a there's a there's a nice sort of crema developing or a foam which hasn't been present on the last two something about 60 degrees celsius makes it froth up a bit we'll, we'll see if that increases from uh, 80 and then up to 100. That there's the 98 degrees Celsius one and the amount of foam that just grew on that was incredible. Uh, it smells like um, mocha pot. It smells like what comes out when, you, when you're you know, doing something on the stove top. 
to be honest, they've all had quite a wide variety of smells. I expect that uh, we're going to be able to make something pretty interesting, force a bit of complexity across our five coffees. Five different coffees. 20, 40, 60, 80, 98. But as you can see, we, they get increasingly dark as, the, as you go across the, uh, the spectrum of temperature. And uh, we're gonna have a little sample of all of them. The cold brew one. Oh, that's completely inoffensive. Very, very smooth flavor. 40 degrees Celsius one. That one's got a little bit more bitterness developing towards the end. Far out. To be honest, it sits, it sits sort of in the middle of what you would get off a stove top or espresso or something like that and the cold brew. 80 degrees. That one's got like a, that, that's, this one's actually nicer than that one I think. It's not as bitter. I think this one, um, hits off with a bit of sweetness and then the, the bitterness rolls in a bit afterwards. It just tastes like cold uh, stove top coffee. But what I want to do is uh, grab this and I want to make a super coffee. Uh, we're going to do 50 mils of coffee, equal ratios. So we're going to have 10 mils of each. So this was the desire all along, it was to force a little bit of complexity into the coffee by brewing at different temperatures and seeing what we could create other than just ramping everything up to 100 and just seeing what comes out. You know, we put a, they put a lot of love into the roasting, maybe not this one, but they put a lot of love into their roasting, which means that maybe we should put a little bit of love into the brewing process as well, or at least a little bit of care. So we'll give a little sample of that. It, uh, it does what, exactly what you'd expect. I mean, I don't know what other result we should be anticipating, but it's smooth at the start. It ramps up into a bit of bitterness, and then you've got to, like, a few flavors coming out, a little bit of chocolate flavors, and a little bit of acid, a little bit of sourness. It's really, really, really nice. These two sort of get balanced out. It's like shading while you're painting, you know? You're sort of, like, blending those colors in together. But, like... We'll give it another try and see if we can fine tune this a little bit. See, I'd say it's probably a little bit too sour up front. So what I might do is I might weight it with a ratio that favors the lighter brews with the darker brews sort of providing a bit of an accent. So here it is. Looks pretty nice. It sort of sits around about here in terms of color. Very scientific, I know, but you got to look at these things. The smell doesn't smell as acrid as uh, really, really dark mud coffee smells, which is nice to know also. It's a bit smoother, a little bit sweeter smelling, which sort of indicates, you know, how I've tipped the scales on it. So we'll give it a little bit of a taste, see how it compares to that one. Yep. Well, okay, so that's a lot smoother, a lot, lot smoother. So we've got like this being the bulk of it with these little sharper notes increasing towards the end. So we actually get a lot of sweetness up front, although I suppose traditionally you wouldn't call it sweet, but for coffee it's sweet. And then it sort of moves into sort of like these acidy flavors and only just now I'm starting to get the flavor of the slightly burnt one, which, was, which is quite, quite pleasant, having a little bit of like a attitude running up, the, running up the guts right at the end, which is nice. But none of this would be really worth anything unless I could get the approval of an Italian. And so we've got Fede from uh, Airbnb Feast Rome coming over later today and she's going to give the coffee a sample and see whether I'm right or wrong. Talking about uh, Italian coffee being quite, uh, quite bitter, maybe I should make a, a third brew. I think I might. Uh, I'm going to do the inverse of what I was doing before. I'm actually going to weight the coffee towards the bitter end and see if that makes a difference. It'll be interesting to test. So here's the rough brew. But it's definitely, definitely, you can smell that it's weighted towards the dark coffees. So we'll see how we go. 
just a little splash of each, doesn't have to be a lot. Cheers! Salute! Cheers. Salute. <laughs> it's alright, a bit light for me. A bit light? Okay, cool. It's very, um... Yeah, light, but... No, I mean, you can taste, you can taste, it's quite, the taste is quite strong. Okay. But I just feel like it's light in the sense that it's very liquid. It's mm. not so dense. Yeah. Syrupy, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, but the taste is very strong. I think I'm not going to be able to sleep mm. tonight. This is more what an Italian coffee might taste like. Okay, so I think when it's, that's interesting. Mm. All right, so. This is very strong. Yeah, this is reminds me more of like a cold espresso. Okay. I yeah I agree. <laughs> what are you laughing? But it also has. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's very bitter. All right. Mm. Mm. No. No, it's very. I think watery. this is the light, the one yeah. that tastes less like coffee out of all of the three. This one. That one. Okay. I mean, the very is very diluted. Okay. The, this one is quite watery for me. So which, yeah. which one was your favorite? This one. The middle me. one? Yeah. All right. That's not what I expected at all. I expected Fede and Lily to go towards the darker roast because to me, that's what Italian coffee tastes like. But they didn't. And I guess that's where the nuance is. We all went for the light, lighter flavored brew because I think it does generally, yeah, you know, it does taste good and it probably did taste the best out of all of them. But we've got different expectations about where good coffee should come from. Even though we fundamentally disagree about what Italian coffee tastes like. So, that raises an interesting psychological question, doesn't it? But, there's a few things we can learn from this. One, flavour shifts dramatically across temperatures. Earthy bitterness becomes a sharp, almost sour flavor. Another thing we've learned is that texture and temperature are really important. You need that syrupy mouth feel and that warm mouth hug that comes from a hot cup of coffee. So what I've learned from this is depending on my palate, I can just sort of change the temperatures and work around with things to see how I like to taste coffee. It doesn't all have to be the same mud, but it does raise the question and a really, really strange question is, how much does your own psychology and memory have to do with what you perceive things to taste like? And if that's the case, just how radically different is taste from person to person? I think that's a question for another episode. It's a seriously dissatisfying answer for something that took a very, very long time that it just comes up to personal preference, but it does allow me to say this at the very least. New Zealand does it way better than Australia. Mm -hmm.